Awesome. Thank you so much, Cassie. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you all again for being here. Uh, my name is Maya Vucic. Um, I am a freshman in Weinberg, uh, she, her, hers. I will be your lead moderator today, um, along with Elena. Elena, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Elena. I'm a senior at Northwestern studying history with minors in political science and data science. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. I've been interested in museum studies for a while, so this is really exciting. Cool. Um, so we have a great lineup of alumni here to speak with us today. Um, so like Cassie said, we'll hear from them for about 40, 45 minutes, um, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So um, until then, feel free to chat Elena with your questions, um, and uh, we'll reach those around 12.15. Um, but for now, um, let's hear some introductions from our wonderful alumni panel here today, um, starting with uh, Whitney Owens. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. I'm Whitney. Um, I graduated from Weinberg in 1999. I uh, majored in English and I was in the writing program. So I had a concentration in fiction writing and a minor in religious studies. I am currently the chief learning officer for Cincinnati Museum Center. Um, we are a children's museum, a science and natural history museum, and a history museum, all three of us in uh, and a beautiful old Art Deco train station in Cincinnati. And in my role, I lead education, exhibit development, and research and collections, as well as community engagement. Glad to be with you. And next we have uh, Kay Miller. Hello, everyone. My name is Kendra, often go by Kay Miller, she, her, hers. I am a graduate of Weinberg from 1992. Currently, I have my own business as an art appraiser, which I've been since 2004, and I focus on modern and contemporary art. I'm really excited to explore today with you, and thank you for joining. And next we have Jessica Bell Brown. Hi everyone, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, my name is Jessica Bell Brown. I graduated from Weinberg in 2009. I studied art history and minored in business institutions. I'm currently the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Baltimore Museum of Art, which is a demi encyclopedic institution. And under my purview, I focus on um, incredible making incredible exhibitions and bringing in phenomenal works into the museum's collection. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah Urist Green. I graduated from Weinberg in um, 2002 and I was an art theory and practice major. Um, I've worked in a variety of roles, but um, I was a curator of contemporary art at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And I developed a web series with PBS called The Art Assignment. Um, and um, I'm also producing a web series about poetry with the Poetry Foundation called Hours Poetica. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we're excited to hear from you today. Um, so a question to get us all started. Um, I'm going to ask you all to think back to your time at Weinberg. Um, and can you share with us some of the impactful classes or experiences that you had while you were at Northwestern um, that led you to pursue a career in art or museum administration? Um, and we'll go backwards this time, starting with Sarah. Um, I have so many great experiences from my undergraduate um, time at Northwestern, even though the whole time I thought I wanted to be a graphic designer. So I was not planning at all on working um, in museums. And I, um, I was mostly making art and reading about art theory um, and art criticism. And I really enjoyed getting to know the art, uh, the art faculty at Northwestern, um, Ed Paschke was an amazing Chicago images painter um, who was teaching there at the time. And I took classes with him and got to visit his amazing studio. And um, that was really cool. And um, Jim Yud um, taught art criticism and art theory at the time. And I remember he sent us 
um, to go to um, see the Art Chicago Art Fair um, and had us write a, a summary of our experience there. And that was sort of the first time that I thought about like the, the organism of, of the art world and how it all worked. Um, I also remember um, some friends and I um, were made our own like web design. This was, you know, 1999. Uh, and uh, my friends and I uh, asked the art department if we could make a website for them that was just for the art department. And so we did that. And that's, of course, long gone. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the faculty um, was really uh, super impactful for me and just wonderful artists and thinkers and um, really inspired me. Great, and uh, Jessica? I would say like Sarah, I would say the world we, at Northwestern has and continue had and continues to have a world-class faculty and um, when I, when I entered into Weinberg, I was, I thought I was pre-med, probably like, probably half of you on this call <laughs> might think you're pre-med <laughs> and some of you will stick with it and other, others will kind of probably discover that like, there's a whole world, um, um, to dive into. Um, so I would say sophomore year, I took my first art history class with, um, I want to say Christine Bell, who was an adjunct at the time, and it was an introduction to American art, and I just completely fell in love with the discipline. Um, I had really wonderful working relationships with um, Dr. Huey Copeland and Dr. Krista Thompson, um, and who later would sort of become my advisors, and um, really did a deep dive into the discipline. Um, one of my favorite experiences um, was taking a class, a graduate level class with um, students from um, SAIC and U Chicago and the Northwestern grad students as well, um, co-taught by Huey Copeland and um, Darby English, who was a professor at U Chicago. And that class was phenomenal because it really challenged me to be a better writer, a better thinker. Um, we were out in the world. We did visits with collectors, with museums, um, and um, we went to the Johnson Publishing Company headquarters. Um, it was it was so eye opening, and I think really solidified that that's um, I, I I found my groove, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, my, I think that sort of academic development at, in my time at Northwestern was by far one of the most important experiences that has stayed with me um, throughout. Awesome, Kay? Oh, I'm so sorry, we can't hear you right now. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I pushed the button hard enough. Okay. Um, I was a psychology major when I entered Northwestern and I was on the neuroscience track. I would always had a love of art history that was instilled by my fourth grade teacher. So, you know, just to relax, I would take a number of art history classes and that began in the spring of my soft, I mean, my, my freshman year when I was taking statistics and a few other classes that were really hard to, to manage. So, you know, one of the things that I found towards the end of my time is that as I was matriculating through psychology on that neuroscience track, I realized I didn't want to work in a lab. I was still interested in Alzheimer's and everything that had to do with the brain, but I felt my joy and passion and um, wonderful experiences through the courses that I took in art history. And one in particular was the essentials of design. And that just gave me an opportunity to really open up my avenues of creativity, which I really hadn't done since I was a girl. As you know, because you're at Northwestern too, we have a tendency to be very planned and pragmatic. And just like Jessica, who said she was going to be um, pre-med, so she just knew she was going to be a doctor. And that it, that's a smart move. Those are things that make sense for us. But along the way, I found that it was more important for me to lead with my heart and lead with my passions. And I'm really glad that I did. So I ended up the summer of my junior year going to my dean and saying, well, what am I going to do? I'm supposed to graduate next year. 
And so we looked at my natural affinities and I could choose art history, the history of literature and religion, or um, the history of languages and literature. And I chose art history and I'm very glad that I did. Great, and last but not least, Whitney. Um, I entered Northwestern convinced that I was going to be an English professor and the head of the department sat me down uh, fall semester freshman year and laid out for me um, how few English PhD students they had and what their job prospects would be. And it was uh, a very small number. And I said, I feel like you're telling me maybe not to be an English professor. And he's like, I'm just laying out the options for you. This was uh, Lawrence Evans at the Times. And uh, so I said, okay, well, maybe I will work for a publishing house and I'll be an editorial, an, an editor. And he was like, great, you're going to start as an editorial assistant. You will be making $18,000 a year. You will be living in an apartment in New York that is a one bedroom that's been subdivided into an eight bedroom. Um, and, you know, that's how you'll start. And I was like, I feel like you're telling me not to be an editor. <laughs> Else. Like I'm just laying out the options for you. So I really appreciated that reality check so early in my academic career. And I'd always loved writing and the writing program was transformative for me, taking classes with Reg Gibbons and Mary Kinsey and thinking about how you make meaning, how we tell stories. Um, that's really at the essence of museums and I use those skills every day. Uh, and in addition to the academic experience, I found extracurriculars at Northwestern um, just extraordinary for building leadership and exploring options. So um, I ended up co-chairing Arts Alliance, the theater company. Um, and at that time we produced like 12 shows a year. Um, and that was a great lesson in leading in the arts and what it takes to fundraise for shows and market them and build audience and build sets. Um, and was also editor of Helicon Literary Art Magazine. That again, leading a team, putting together um, a portfolio, supporting artists, recognizing artists and sharing their work with others. Um, and being part of those leadership positions at Northwestern um, made me realize that I really liked leading in the arts. Uh, and so I was at a, a campus job fair the summer before my senior year and um, handed off my resume to the Field Museum and the Art Institute and ended up with an internship in public relations at the Field Museum. Um, and from that moment on, my career was set in museums. And um, here I am uh, 20 plus years later. Um, and so I credit both the academics and the faculty at Northwestern, but also the leadership opportunities that um, our extracurriculars afford um, that were uh, really, I think, formative for me and helping me uh, find my way that was, as I think all of us have said now, a little different from the way I thought I was making when I entered campus. Those were all fantastic answers. And as someone who's thoroughly undecided in what I want to do, I appreciate how you each kind of touched upon coming into Weinberg with kind of one idea of an end, but realizing that there are so many other paths you can take. So thank you for those answers. Um, and this time we'll start with Whitney and we'll work backwards, but um, I'm curious, what was your first job out of undergrad and how did that impact your career path later in life? And that's a great question. So I'll start um, with that first uh, internship um, at the Field Museum. My summer project was actually a writing one and it was creating a media guide to all of the curators at the Field Museum. So my summer project was to interview all of these amazing scientists that um, were deeply knowledgeable in a very narrow subject. So like the world's foremost experts on this um, breed of African shrew, for instance. Um, and then to uh, communicate clearly what their research was about to the public so that if, let's say, a journalist at the Tribune was doing a story on ants, they could um, find our ant curator and call her up and uh, that would get the Field Museum um, into the media. Um, and that was such a wonderful experience. And I fell in love not only with um, communicating science uh, and other academic disciplines clearly and engagingly for the public, um, but uh, also with the Field Museum specifically. So I um, got my master's in London um, and interned at the Natural History Museum there for a little while. And when I moved back to Chicago, um, I knew I wanted to work for the field. I applied for every job on their website, including ones that I was wildly unqualified for, like the director of corporate sponsorship um, at like 23, uh, never having had professional work experience in the field uh, other than the internships. 
And finally, uh, someone that I had interned with passed my resume on to a vice president who um, was looking for someone, a person to do a thing, and my my skills fit the bill. And so I started um, as a special projects coordinator that I'd say is like part executive assistant, um, part sort of doer of all the things. And it was very much an entry level job, but because I reported to a vice president, I got to sit at the table with the directors of exhibitions and education and marketing and PR and retail and just learning from them and being, you know, just a uh, really onlooker of those conversations that were happening at that level taught me so much um, about leadership and about different aspects of um, what it means to lead a museum. Um, and eventually I moved into um, exhibitions and uh, then you know, traveled on. So um, I think one of my lessons from that experience is it can be a little disheartening to get out of undergrad or even to get your master's, which is what I had, and then realize that like the, the jobs you're getting the most callbacks for are administrative assistant positions. Um, um, but after working in museums for many years, I can also tell you those are great ways to get your feet in the door. Um, we had so many as folks that started in that role or now at, at Cincinnati Museum Center start, you know, selling tickets at our, our um, admissions desk who move um, into other roles in the organization, including up to senior leadership. So um, keeping your options open about what that first job might be for you in this field um, is something that I, I um, I uh, needed to do myself and, and like to share with those thinking about getting into the field. Great. Um, Kay? Well, one of my first jobs right out of college was with Linda Heights Designs. And as I mentioned, I took the Essentials of Design class, just completely loved making. And I was a decorative artist apprentice. So anything faux I was doing, so faux marbling and just spackling um, different sorts of textures on walls. And that was really fun for me. But I realized something essential. I do not have good maker skills. <laughs> and so with that reality, I, I did learn that um, because she was an entrepreneur and it was a relatively small company. So I did have an opportunity to do other things in the business. And that's where I learned that my greatest strengths were in just organizational skills and also business development and things of that sort. So I was helping her more on that end of the business. I completely enjoyed it. And it gave me the idea that I wanted to open a business of my own, which had always been my plan um, at the after working with her. And I kind of meandered along the way with other sort of career opportunities, but always along that same vein with that plan that I had in mind. So, you know, that was a great experience for me. And I, I really am appreciative of learning that it, it gave me an opportunity to learn that you need to have a little bit of flexibility in your plans. And I think all of us have these grand plans of things that we want to do, and we're very set on the path that we want to take. But sometimes it's okay to look at other options and to meander along the way. And as Whitney was saying, sometimes things just don't work quite as you're expecting in terms of where you want to take that plan. But just know that it is going to turn into something that you need, but you need to be persistent about it and think about alternate routes. So I, what, that's one of the things that I found really helpful about working there. Although I loved trying my hand at making these faux finishes, but um, that was the greatest lesson that I learned from that job. Awesome, thank you. Jessica? Sure, so my first job out of college was actually as an English teacher for Teach for America. I graduated um, in 2009, so some of you, if, if you're thinking about the sort of crisis moment of 2020 with the pandemic, it was, I, minus the pandemic, 2008, 2009 was a really unstable time um, economically. And I knew that I, at the time I wanted to go to graduate school, but I wasn't really sure just yet um, what I wanted to pursue for my dissertation. So, and I knew I didn't want to take a finance job or I was just trying to figure it out, figure out how I can, how I can continue to grow um, and, you know, give myself um, a moment of, of uh, reprieve. And so I did teach for America. Um, I always say during my, my three years that I taught in Washington, DC, um, I taught eighth grade English, um, that my students taught me more than I ever taught them. 
And it still rings true today. I think students are, kids are just brutally honest <laughs> and um, um, also so genuine and like um, they're straight shooters. And, you know, as a, as a teacher, it's very much, um, you know, it's, it's very much um, a part of the job that you have to present ideas in ways that are accessible and exciting and engaging. Um, and in addition to that, I would say, um, you know, there's no better or greater project manager than a teacher who's managing a hundred plus students um, times two plus their parents times like, a, you know, probably three, a set of, you know, administrators within the school, you know, tracking progress, um, you know, assessing um, what's working, what's not. All of those skills are um, so applicable to so many um, of um, so many um, jobs that you probably will sort of go into as you graduate. But in, in, as it relates to working with curators, I think it's like, or working with curators and artists, it's very um, similar. Many museums are heavily curator driven. And so we, you know, have to liaise not only with the artists and our, our you know, our small sort of curatorial teams, but with the marketing department and with the installation crew and with the exhibitions, you know, team. And um, there's also a community, um, you know, community engagement piece as well. And so um, in thinking about my time um, as a teacher, which was incredible and, and challenging in the best of ways, um, I still lean on those skills today. Um, I would say after Teach for America, I knew that I wanted to jump back into the arts. And so I took an entry level job in New York at um, a public agency, art agency called Creative Time, which manages these um, ethereal um, and um, dreamy large scale projects that um, don't that aren't necessarily in galleries and museums, but in the sort of wildest of places like let's say the Kara Walker, some of you might know Kara Walker's um, infamous sugar baby at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn. Um, so those types of, of projects, um, those skills that I learned as a teacher were, were, um, were indispensable. Um, okay, so my first job out of undergrad was as a reservationist at a restaurant. <laughs> um, I moved uh, downtown Chicago and was applying for jobs and working at this restaurant. And it was actually <laughs> a very good um, education in how to make phone calls in a room full of people. Because I, I know this younger generations especially hate phone calls. Well, I did too. Um, and I had to like call this entire reservation reservation list in front of like a room packed full of like chefs and other people. And it was like, it, it, it was very good for me. Um, now I can call anybody and it's not a problem, but I was applying for jobs and it took me a while. Um, I was looking for a job in graphic design and doing freelance graphic design. And it just wasn't, it wasn't coming together for me. And uh, so I got a job at an art gallery in the West Loop. Um, that was showing um, uh, contemporary art from China and India. Um, and the Chinese art market was just starting to really boom um, in the early 2000s. So uh, it was, I, I knew nothing about Chinese or Indian art at the time. And I just kind of uh, had to wing it um, during my interview. The a uh, gallery director asked me to talk about an artwork that I'd never seen before that was hanging in the gallery. <laughs> it was, um, it was like, it was like a historical painting about the history of India, which I wasn't super familiar with. Um, I recognized Gandhi and I just did my best to talk my way around it. Um, and they hired me. Uh, and so that was a great experience. And it was at working at the gallery um, that I started to meet curators from museums around Chicago. Uh, and I thought, what could be a cooler job <laughs> than being a curator and having permission uh, to reach out to all of the amazing artists working in your community, asking for a studio visit, seeing which artists um, from your community or beyond uh, like are a good match for 
the, the visitorship of your museum or who you want to be the visitorship of the museum. So the, those early jobs um, were really fundamental. And from there, I went back to um, graduate school in art history um, and, and left Chicago from there. But yeah, I mean, I, I totally... Um, and then I ended up losing, <laughs> leaving my <laughs> museum job to make uh, online video uh, about art and art history on YouTube. I and mean, YouTube didn't exist when I graduated from college. So like part of this is like that our landscape is changing <laughs> so extremely all the time that like I couldn't have planned to be a YouTube art educator that just, it didn't exist and it would, didn't make sense. So I think um, my early experiences uh, uh, taught me to be nimble and to embrace the opportunities that come your way. What great stories of like serendipity. That's the only word that comes to mind. I really, those were great to hear. So thank you all for sharing. Um, now, now that we kind of heard about your entries into the art industry, um, what was one of your favorite jobs throughout your career? That's not what you're doing now. And we'll start with Sarah. Um, yeah, I think when I was a contemporary art curator at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, um, I was in grad school in New York and had no connection to Indianapolis. And um, when I was interviewing for jobs, um, I spoke to the then leadership of the museum and they were developing this art park behind the museum um, called 100 Acres where um, we would be inviting artists from around the world to come create site responsive installations um, in the park. And, you know, uh, most of my friends in graduate school in New York had no interest in leaving New York, uh, certainly not moving to Indianapolis. And I was really glad that I took that leap and, um, and moved to Indy and worked at this job because it really, having the flexibility to leave <laughs> a sort of like um, power center of culture and go uh, elsewhere kind of allowed me to cut my teeth uh, curatorially and in a position where like I, I had more freedom almost because I didn't feel like the, the world was watching really. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was wonderful. I got to work directly with artists to uh, commission outdoor um, site specific works for this park that uh, is still free and open to the public. And, um, it was a fantastic learning experience. And if I had, you know, if I was starting that again, I would make totally different decisions, but you can't know that until you've already done it. So yeah, that was, I mean, it was a wonderful job um, and I'm glad to have done it. Very cool, thank you. Jessica? I've been trying to think, what do I wanna talk about? Like um, there've been so many, incredible experiences that I've had um, that are, that were fought for. <laughs> um, I would say, I, I would say two, I would say two things. Um, I think as a curator, um, one of the sort of undersung aspects of, of our work is bringing in um, um, objects into the collection. And I, when I say undersung, it means it's something that happens like through a lot of procedure and a lot of sort of administration um, but it's not something that is, you know, exhibitions are marquee for in the museum space. Um, but most recently I worked on um, bringing in um, a work by um, artist Neri Ward into the BMA col collection. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar, Neri Ward is um, um, a highly accomplished American sculptor and installation artist of um, Jamaican descent and um, was working in New York um, in, the, in the early 90s, um, making um, really sort of unprecedented large scale um, sculpture from sort of salvaged, um, um, salvaged materials like um, um, decommissioned um, fire hoses and um, strollers and 
um, you name it, it's in the art. <clears throat> so I brought in um, into the BMA collection, um, the, probably the most impractical object ever <laughs> to come into, into the museum's holdings, which was his work called Peacekeeper, which was created in, um, in 1995 for the Whitney Biennial. And um, it consists of a hearse that's tarred and feathered with grease and um, peacock feathers and goose feathers and enclosed in this metal wrought, uh, like, you know, um, hand wrought cage. Um, the piece was destroyed in, um, the piece was destroyed um, about 10 years after Neri Ward made it because again, it's so impractical and no museum, you know, was brave enough to buy it. And so um, as part of a show that opened last year called Grief and Grievance um, at the new museum, it was re, um, 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 recommissioned, let's say, and the Baltimore Museum stepped up and said, okay, we want to buy this. And um, that was probably one of the most rewarding experiences. Um, and then I would say the second experience was working on this project called She Persists, a Century of Women Artists in New York, which was a collaboration with um, um, the de Blasio administration in New York City. Um, so I work with First Lady Charlene McRae um, to install contemporary art for the first time at Gracie Mansion, which is this sort of seat of power um, in New York and is a sort of semi, um, it's, a, it's a public institution, but also a part sort of, it is uh, the residence of, um, of the uh, principles of the house mayor and first lady. And that was just like um, something that, I never would have thought to have done before. Like I typically work in white boxes, not with, with you know, historical um, sort of sites. And um, I think my sort of newness to that space or as an outsider, um, as a, a sort of not a, a curator of museums and not um, historic sites really sort of brought um, a freshness. Um, and I don't know, I think my, the, the takeaway from, the takeaway from both of those experiences, I think, would be encouraging you to step outside of the box as much as you can and uh, sort of be brave and intrepid um, and knowing that maybe years down the line, it'll all make sense, but it's okay if it doesn't make sense to you in the moment. Um, so that applies to your studies right now. It applies to the kinds of internships that you that you seek out. Um, but yeah, just trust your gut and um, and do the thing, and it will it will reward you tenfold. Very wise words. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. One of my most favorite jobs, and it was unexpected for me. So as I mentioned, I knew that I wanted to open a business. And I said, you know, there's some skills I don't have. I don't know how to market. I don't know how to sell in a non farmy way. So I decided that I was going to be a fundraiser. I had gone to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for um, my master's in arts administration. And we had these wonderful modules. They were related to any and everything that you need to learn about in arts administration. And they were actually taught by, we, we had theory and practice, and they were actually taught by a lot of the people who were working there in the industry at the time. So Carlos Totelero and all of these other wonderful people. And so I was really intrigued by the development module. And I actually decided that I was going to work in development. So I began working at the Chicago, it's now the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. I also moved quickly from there to, um, to um, manage a shop of my own at what is now Chicago River North. And after that, I moved to DC and I was still doing fundraising in the arts. And um, I eventually added nonprofit since that is a, a passion of mine as well. So, I mean, sorry, environment. So since that's a, a passion of mine as well. So one of the things that is the thread between all of those development positions was special events. I loved planning special events. So anything from the craziest thing for an environmental policy nonprofit was an art, and historical preservation bus tour. So we went from Milford, Pennsylvania, just about an hour or so outside of New York City, 
all the way to Philadelphia. And, you know, I had some activities on the bus for these major donors and charter bus. And it was a fun sort of thing. We stopped along the way at a historic house and had a little tour and conversation. And then we ended our day in, well, our morning in um, Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where we saw all of the wonderful Hudson River School painters that were had come from the Tate. So that was an amazing experience for them. It was my most favorite special event, but I've also coordinated everything from galas to intimate receptions, uh, friend raising events, uh, just you name it, any sort of special event was my favorite to do. So, you know, the planning aspect of it, the executive management of aspect, I did everything from soup to nuts with regards to event planning. And, you know, it was really wonderful to be able to conceive of events. So for instance, at Chicago River North, since it is a contemporary dance company, I decided that the first event was going to be a 1940s gala, a swank little affair. And so that was fun. And we actually had our donors and patrons coming to the event in costume. And uh, so, you know, just being able to be creative, but in different ways was fun for me. Also, just shoring up my business skills, um, learning how to talk with people, especially about money. When you're asking a drug company that makes cancer drugs for $250,000 in support for a Shakespearean production, that may seem frivolous, but one of the things is just being able to learn how to, having the opportunity to learn how to justify a case was something that I learned through the fundraising experience. And especially with regard to being able to build an event because you're asking for silent auction items and things of that sort. So it was fun and amazing experience. I was a fundraiser for, I would say 12 years, but even after I started my business, I was still doing a little bit of it on consulting basis. And one organization just brought me back because they needed a little help. I was very good at building organizations from no base to at least a somewhat solid base. So it was nice to be able to see the imprint of my hand along the way and to be able to stretch my skills and imagine things that I never thought I would have been able to do. But that's part of the entrepreneurial spirit. You don't have any tried and true experience with something. And, you know, my time at, at Northwestern gave me the courage to be bold and to do, I, I grew up very sheltered and I was, I tended to be rather reserved until people got to know me. But when you are out front and center and you're the number two person at the organization, it gives you an opportunity to be bold and to learn how to stretch yourself in amazing sorts of ways. So that was fun for me. And it was one of the best experiences. I mean, as a fundraising generalist, I did other things as well, such as corporate foundation and government support. But I really, an individual, I really loved doing the special events and working with people and creating something that had not existed. And also just being able to see the enjoyment on people's faces whenever an event happened. And I love the executive planning at the end as well when you're deconstructing event and you're trying to figure out the ways in which you can improve upon processes for the next year or, you know, doing a SWOT analysis and figuring out what went well, what did not go well. So that was something that was great. And I think my time at Northwestern, especially having an opportunity to go through art history um, courses, like I said, I was a psychology major, but I always took art history courses after the, the spring semester, uh, spring quarter rather. And um, it was, it gave me the idea that culture is important. And I knew that before, just intellectually, we'd always, my family had done arts and cultural events, but just to be able to see the effect that it has in different cultures along the way and how essential it is to life made me realize that I want to spend my time and effort on something that's meaningful. And even if a nuclear bomb hits and nothing else exists and we have to start over at a certain base, then I want to contribute to something that is going to be systemic, that is going to um, bring joy and something that really defines a culture. And from there, 
um, like I said, I always knew I was going to open a business, but dealing with money and dealing with bringing in money made me think a lot about value. And that's how I ended up being an art appraiser after going to the George Washington University Center for Professional Development to get a certificate in fine and decorative art appraisal studies. So that I think was the best experience in my career. I currently teach now and I enjoy that because it keeps the scholarship sharp. I enjoy it for all the, the reasons that Jessica was saying, but I think my most favorite job and my most favorite experience throughout my career were special events. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, and Whitney? I like to go to some of Kay's events. They sound really fun. Um, my favorite job was actually uh, the one I had at the Field Museum for the longest. I was there for about 12 years in a variety of roles. Um, but my favorite role there was being their director of traveling exhibits. And um, my, my second job at the field, um, after the one I mentioned, was um, as sort of a project manager for traveling exhibits. And when I took the role, we had um, three different exhibits, uh, two of which were casts of the T-Rex Sioux. Um, that we would uh, lease to other museums around the country and send there for a period of time. And um, when I left the museum, we had a portfolio of about 15 exhibitions. So it was really a growth enterprise and building a team, building a network of relationships with um, other museums. And uh, in, I think it was 2005, a Japanese media company came to us and said, we would really like to bring one of your casts of Sue to Japan um, for a four city tour. Uh, as part of this big dinosaur expo and that was we had, had never taken any exhibitions overseas and um, it took some convincing of our leadership but we decided to do it and so um, when we were opening this exhibition in Tokyo um, it was my role to reach out to all of these different museums in uh, Asia and Australia and New Zealand um, because once it was in that that specific part of the world we didn't want to bring it right back we wanted to see if it could travel some other places and so you know arranging this opening with um, museum delegates from Singapore and Thailand and China and New Zealand um, and Taiwan and so I uh, over the next um, several years that is where the exhibition ended up going um, and to Kuwait and to Costa Rica and to Panama and so um, it was my job to build relationships with each of those museums and those cultures um, which meant um, wonder some wonderful experiences working with um, the consulates general and embassies in Chicago um, learning about uh, culture and diplomacy and how you conduct business in those cultures for each of the places that we were traveling, um, some of which are very different, of course, than, than the U.S. You know, in some cultures, I can shake hands with a man. In other cultures, I can't. Um, you know, business cards mean different things and need to be exchanged in very specific ways in different cultures. So I still have a collection of my business cards printed in Korean and Japanese, Mandarin, um, that I cherish. And the time, uh, there was about three or four years um, before I had kids that I was um, traveling abroad um, frequently between Asia uh, and sometimes Europe and sometimes Central and South America. And um, it was the most uh, marvelous experience. And I, I learned so much about cultural humility and cultural diplomacy um, that traveled to cultures that really take hospitality like as a, a mark of honor on their, their culture. And it made me think, um, so much returning to Chicago, where I would often pass, you know, someone on a corner in Chicago with a map, obviously trying to find their way and see all the commuters just passing right by them, where in contrast that to my experience um, in, let's say, um, Kyoto, Japan, where uh, we would be, you know, walking by shops and it would start to rain and a shopkeeper would come out and give us an umbrella so that we as vis clear visitors to their country um, did not get wet during our visit. So um, it taught me a lot about hospitality and uh, working with others and being humble in that that I use in our community engagement work all the time. Um, and also um, built upon a curiosity I always had and, and stoked it even further to learn more about all the variations of human experience throughout the world. Um, of which I saw only a very small sliver when I was growing up in Kansas. Um, and uh, I have taken those experiences and those friendships and those relationships with um, different museum professionals the worldwide um, with me, uh, even as I moved on um, from that role to other adventures. But it was um, a wonderful way to see the world. And um, not only as a tourist, which I frequently was, but as someone who was actually working and living for a brief period of time in that culture, you see, you see it differently. Um, when you see, you know, people's offices. Um, and again, that trust, I, we were installing an exhibition in um, Taiwan and
and uh, our installation chief and I were talking over, you know, we, we finished a day early, what should we do with our extra day? It would be great to see the nature preserve um, nearby the small Taiwanese city where we were working. And our translator overheard us speaking and said, oh, you should do that and take my car. And he said, what? Like, I don't have a Taiwanese driver's license. I do not speak Mandarin. Uh, I, you know, we didn't have Google Maps at that point to know how to get around. And uh, we don't have in whatever insurance you have here. And she handed over her keys and was like, I trust you. Bring it back tomorrow. Um, so that uh, just, you know, again, wonderful hospitality um, and genuine desire to, to understand each other and build bridges across difference is something that I'll, I'll take with me always. Wow, thank you all so much for those insightful um, those insightful comments. Um, that was that was really great, very interesting. Uh, have Whitney, you've inspired my wanderlust again. Um, I'm itching to travel. Um, now we're going to open it up for student questions, and I'm going to pass it off to Elena. Yeah, thank you, Maya, and, and thank you to all our panelists. It's been so interesting to hear about everyone's different opportunities and experiences in the museum world. I think just to hear how, how many different opportunities and experiences there are has been really interesting. Um, so I'm gonna start with a, a student question um, from June. Um, June asks for Whitney, um, kind of specifically, but also for everybody, um, how were the starting prospects like pay and living conditions um, compared to, for, for Whitney specifically, like the editorial job path that <laughs> you had mentioned to your professor in your freshman year? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'll just, I love the name June. That's my daughter's name. Um, uh, it's, fortunately, Professor Evans set a very low bar in describing the um, editorial assistant salary that I'm, I'm happy to report I was able to um, surpass. But I'll say I got really lucky in the person that I started working for at the Field Museum. She, um, prior to becoming a vice president there, had been a vice president at City um, Bank and was one of the very few female vice presidents there. I mean, she had so many more stories about um, that and about being a single mother in that environment and managing gender roles and expectations and stereotypes in that environment. And she was a real champion for women's rights. And so she started me at $35,000 a year in 2000, um, which was um, a lot for an entry level position um, in museums at that time. Um, uh, as I learned when I, I took other roles and got promoted, but uh, didn't actually get a raise because they're like, she brought you in really high. Um, so I, uh, that was, I was just extraordinarily lucky. I can tell you that, um, you know, Cincinnati is a different market certainly than Chicago, but if you start uh, as like a floor educator for us or someone who's helping sell tickets at the box office um, or working in our security offices, I also have, by the way, several friends in museum leadership that started as museum security guards. Um, you're gonna start at about $13 an hour. It goes a little farther in Cincinnati than it goes in Chicago, um, but wage equity is something that the entire museum field is focusing on and struggling with right now. In fact, one of the conversations we're having internally is um, we uh, went through a significant staff reduction during COVID, um, cut about 55% of our positions. And um, as the museum reopened and we've gotten back on more stable financing, we've made a very conscious decision not to go back to staffing levels that we had pre-COVID. We want to have fewer people so we can pay them more. Um, um, but that um, conversations about pay equity are very present in the museum world. Um, and uh, it's one that we're actively engaged in as well. Um, I will tell you, however, my father's in business. Um, he, he worked in the telecoms and he used to tell me how much I could make in a for-profit job. It's my nonprofit job. Don't have those conversations. They're not, um, uh, not terribly inspiring. Uh, and um, trying to figure out our arts model. Another thing that um, working around the world gave me exposure to is how the arts are funded in many other countries, which is significantly through the government and through tax dollars. And we've seen um, during COVID that be such a significant source of relief through the Save Our Stages Act, um, Shuttered Venues Grants, PPP, other things. And so um, the arts funding model is one that we do differently in the US than we do in many other places. Um, and I think we see that reflected in um, some of you know what you can expect to earn um, working in the arts here as opposed to other countries. Yeah, if any if anyone else would like to to chime in on on that question, Kay, Sarah, Jessica, <laughs> feel free. 
I think my experience is probably typical. So as a graphic, I'm sorry, not graphic design, as an um, apprentice, I was making about $23,000. And I remember praying for the longest time if I could make 25. So that was my struggle. Yeah, I didn't really make a living uh, until I started working at an art museum. Um, and that was when I got uh, health insurance, when I worked at a gallery. Um, you know, I, I always, I won't name any names, but uh, I remember my boss would buy us all like sushi for lunch and I'd be like, just give me the money. <laughs> like, I don't want that, you know, like I'll eat some soup in the back. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think um, it, it, I took unpaid internships through graduate school. I, I made my way to museums um, with uh, honestly family support. Um, and uh, I really couldn't have done it. So I, I hate that about the art field. And I think that it's trying to change and I uh, embrace the ways that it has, but um, yeah, that's, that's my experience. Yeah, I would say at the BMA, the starting, the, the lowest or the lowest sort of starting salary um, is $40,000 um, for, intern not interns but um fellows and curatorial assistants and um i imagine their sort of counterparts and other um entry-level counterparts and other departments and that was a conscious decision that was made over the last um year and a half um, as the museum took a a look at its um sort of financials and also you know sort of evaluated you know its efforts and pay equity and realized very quickly that you know we were in a really good, we were in a good position to do the right thing, um, not being too terribly shaken by, by um, the pandemic, but, you know, um, there's so much work to be done. And you'll see those of you who are following, you know, the news um, within the field, there's a lot of discussion around unions and, um, you know, the unionization efforts across museums is, um, has really taken off. Um, I would say my when I made the jump from teaching to working at Creative Time, I had um, a fellowship, it was six months. And I don't even, the stipend was so meager, I couldn't even, it's like, it was maybe, maybe like 10, 15,000, it was ridiculous. Um, and I supplemented my income through writing. Writing has always been a way for me to, um, to fill that gap when I was, um, you know, um, starting out in the field. And now I do it more because I just love it. But prior, it was really a necessity um, to supplement my income. Thank you all. Um, I have another question from Asiya, and I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but they ask, and, and I don't know if, if you know this, or even if Casey might know this, um, but if there were any uh, classes offered at Northwestern, maybe that you took or that you knew about that give an overview of mu museum work and curatorship, um, and if that was part of your undergraduate experience. Uh, we, can, we can start with Jessica, if. Um, short answer, no, um, but I think that I think the department at the time, in my experience, was very open to hearing from, you know, the student um, student groups and you know the kind of advocacy around um, around wanting more um, more of a way into um, you know professional advancement and growth and um, you know networking was highly encouraged and I think that if that's something I'm not certain if that ex if a sort of museum path exists. Um, more saliently in the department now, but I think that like, this is the time as a, <laughs> as a young whippersnapper college student to, to, you know, exercise advocating for oneself and, and creating the things that you don't see. Yeah, Sarah. I, I did take a class and I have no idea what it was called, but it took place at the Block Museum. Um, 
and we did a variety, and I don't remember who taught it, but uh, we did a variety of sort of museum-based explorations. It wasn't an overview, uh, but I remember we had to devise our own concepts for museums and write their mission statements. Um, and then I uh, remember we were sent out to actually propose an acquisition for the Black Museum. Um, which was a great exercise and sent us to galleries around Chicago. Um, and I remember um, we, like, I remember I found a print by the Chicago artist Miyoko Ito, um, whose work is really incredible, if you don't know about it, um, that I, I that I proposed to the block. And I think there was some, I think they were going to put forward our um, our proposal for acquisition that we all decided on. I don't remember what happened with it, but it was nice. Um, you know, I don't, I don't actually think like an overview of museum careers would be that helpful to you, honestly, because it's always changing and museums are so um, unique to themselves. They're all structured differently and there are some uh, things in common and maybe someone else would disagree with me, but my, my that, whatever class that was, was a nice, um, a nice sort of introduction. Yeah, okay, go for it. I know specifically at the time when I was at Northwestern, there was nothing of that sort, no class of that sort there. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I went to the Art Institute of Chicago, the school at the Art Institute of Chicago. I really wanted to learn what was what it was about, what museum studies were. It wasn't called museum studies. It was called arts administration and theory and practice. But, you know, being able to learn what I was getting into was important. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you're asking about this type of question. So one of the things that I would encourage if there is no program at Northwestern is to structure, as Jessica was saying, and Sarah was saying, make some suggestions. Also just be bold and um, seek internships. And if they know you're coming in unpaid, um, come with an idea or a project that you would like to work on then that would be a great way to have galleries and even museums. And Whitney probably could speak, and Jessica could probably speak if, better if that's something museums would support. But I know galleries would. I know I had a number of friends who were approaching galleries in the Chicago area with ideas. And they were willing to take them on as an intern. So perhaps that's something that you can consider as well. I'll just add, I know, um, I don't know if it's still there, but I used to guest lecture for the Museum Studies um, certificate that was in the NU School of Continuing Studies um, that Caroline Goldthorpe led, and I think they still lead. So that might be a resource to look into for those interested. Um, I will say there were a couple of museum adjacent classes that might be helpful. Uh, one that I took was European Thought and Culture, and it's overlaying um, history and art history. That was very helpful. And uh, another class, an applied anthropology course also looked at some of that like anthro in practice that was very helpful in a museum context. Yeah, and that I do actually know there's a class in the history department. It's a grad level course, but it's being offered next year um, on museums, um, history specific, but that could be interesting if anyone. Um, if anyone's interested in that. Um, I think we're gonna have to start wrapping things up. Um, unfortunately, um, if anyone um, in, in our panel has any um, sort of last advice for the students that have been here today, um, that will be sort of our, our last um, our last bit. We can start with, with Whitney again and kind of work backwards. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, I left my email address in the chat um, and that gives you our website and we've got a lot of jobs posted right now actually too so please check those out students um, especially soon to be grads um, just to say you know a life in museum and the arts um, is a life of adventure in many ways there is certainly some heartache along the ways we struggle with what that means for you know life choices and those kinds of things but um, it's a, a wonderful environment of wonderfully supportive um, quirky, interesting people. Um, every day is different. It's a wonderful place to be if you love learning and want to keep learning. Um, and uh, just thanks for the opportunity to be here today with these really amazing people on this panel. I'm just honored to be included and excited to see where we all go. I'm, I'm also excited to be here and appreciate the opportunity. One of the things that I would say is to just lead with your passion. 
And when you do, opportunities are going to open up for you because it's infectious and people will say, well, I wonder what it is she's so excited about and uh, just make your opportunities. I know I blazed my trail and I'm very happy that I did. Sarah. <laughs> I love that, Kay. Like, um, love that. Make your opportunities. And I would just add, um, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and work really hard. And don't be afraid. Be that person who's rigorous, who's disciplined and like, you know, like just completely um, unrelenting in terms of your ambition. And it will pay off 10, 20, 30 fold. Uh, this has been great and super enjoyable to hear from other uh, new alums. Um, my, my parting words would be uh, go to office hours, <laughs> develop good relationships with your professors. <laughs> Seriously, you don't want to go maybe, but you should. They're there and they can really, really help you. Um, and two would be very much in line with my fellow panelists, but um, uh, don't get too married to a particular track or position. Uh, when I was at Northwestern, I was surrounded by people who knew exactly what they wanted to do. And some of them are still doing it very successfully. Uh, but it took me a long time to figure out what I want to do. And I'm still working on it. Um, and the world in 15, 20 years is going to be completely different. Um, so be, be nimble, be passionate, be, be um, curious um, about where, where things are going. Thank you all so much. Um, students, thank you so much for logging on today. Um, I know we've already started thanking everybody in the chat, but let's just thank our panelists one more time for their um, such great insights today. Um, we really, really appreciate it. <laughs>